Relief Resources is an international mental health referral network connecting individuals and families with the mental health professionals they need. Through a series of targeted questions, relief referral specialists comb through the database of, of thousands of professionals, carefully connecting the client with the resources necessary. Throughout the client's journey to emotional well-being, Relief offers expertise, guidance, and resources, all in a discreet and confidential manner. Relief Israel is proud to be part of Relief organization, connecting Israeli-based clients with hundreds of local professionals. Today we will hear from Dr. Freeman and Harav Asha Weiss as they discuss complicated mental health challenges from both a professional and halachic perspective. And now uh, to introduce Dr. Freeman, is a board-certified psychiatric and public health advocate based here in Yerushalayim. After completing his training as an award-winning chief resident at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Dr. Freeman made Aliyah with his wife and family. He learns Boba Mati in the morning, Seder, is a popular columnist in Mishpacha magazine and longtime colleague and friend of Relief Resources. Uh, is one of the Poiske Hadar, and we would love to hear from both of them uh, their perspective on many of the questions that we receive. It's a tremendous honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Reb Shlomo. Uh, thank you so much for sitting with us, Rav. I think one of the first questions that it's important for us to ask as we're in the middle of the three weeks uh, that comes up with many of my patients is uh, the question of fasting on Tinus. Um, oftentimes I meet patients who uh, are certainly able to physically withstand uh, a fast. However, the destabilization that could happen uh, from not eating and drinking for a half day and certainly a full day uh, could put them at risk. Uh, in addition to that, I do have plenty of patients who are taking specific medications, including lithium amongst others, that it could be dangerous for their body not to eat or drink for a sustained period of time. So depending on the medical status of a patient, uh, I will oftentimes tell them that it's potentially unsafe for them to go a day without eating or drinking. And uh, Oftentimes, I'll tell them that it's very important to speak with their Rav uh, in order to obtain uh, a heter if necessary. So to answer this question properly, I need to uh, first explain two fundamental hagdamas, or two fundamental assumptions. There is a very fundamental difference between Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av and the other fast days. Yom Kippur, there would be no justification to eat and drink unless it is a Pikuach Nefer situation in which a person's life would be in danger. The other fast days, including Tisha B'Av, even a Chodesh Ha'em Sakona is not required to fast. And that's clearly stated in Tov Kuf Nun Dalad, Siv Dalad. Tisha B'Av, we don't need a professional doctor to assess whether the patient's life might in any way be in jeopardy. That is the lesson of the Shulchan Och. Rab Chaim Briska and Stenzel and the Yoruch Shulchan both argue based on the wording, the formula of the Shulchan Och, that if a person is defined as a choyli, even a choyli she'em busakona, and his life is in no way in jeopardy, he doesn't have any mitzvah to fast on Tisha B'Av. Famous anecdote about the briskarov, and it's very typical of the briskarov. A person once told him, I'm not feeling well, my doctor told me I need to eat on Tisha B'Av, but I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to try, and I think I will fast. So the briskarov told him, that's great, but don't forget Kabbalistan instead of Tisha B'Av by Mincha. What he meant to say is, if your doctor told you you got to eat, then you have no tish above. If you want to fast, it's a tanis yochid. And a tanis yochid, you need to accept a tanis by tefillis mincha. So that is a very harsh and cynical statement, typical to the biskarov. Chsam Soifer seems to have a different opinion, and according to the Chsam Soifer, even if you need to eat, you need to eat as little as possible, or as much as required, but not more than that. So assumption number one, Tisha B'Av, 
even though a person's life will in no way be in jeopardy, but if his health will be negatively affected, then he has no mitzvah to fast on Tisha B'Av. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two. Mental illness is roughly, breaks down into two categories, psychosis and neurosis. And I am not really so qualified to explain this. Dr. Friedman is. And I am somewhat infringing in his territory. So does Gavur. There are two fundamentally different ailments. When a person has psychosis, he might be dangerous to himself and to others, sometimes with suicidal tendencies, sometimes it manifests itself in violent uh, outbreaks. So people that have any form of psychosis cannot fast, and that would be a hatred even for Yom Kippur and not for Tisha B'Av. With neurosis, usually they wouldn't endanger others, neither themselves, but it's unpredictable. And even people that suffer from neurosis, it would affect their balance, their stability, and therefore, if a doctor, a professional doctor, that's a mumch in his field, feels that the patient needs to eat, I would allow him to eat even in Kippur, needless to say, other fast days, including Tisha B'Av. Because we know far more about our bodies than we know about our minds. And I allow myself to make this statement, even though I'm sitting next to a psychiatrist who I greatly admire, admire his professionalism, his elechkeit, his yershamayim. But I do dare to say we know more about any other organ than we know about the mind. And, but we know enough to know that fasting a day might totally disrupt the well-being, the stability, the sense of security of a person that has any mental illness. And therefore, I would give full authority to the treating doctor. And if he feels the patient needs to eat or drink, that is his mitzvah, and that is exactly what he should do. Yeshua Koch, Rav. I think you brought up uh, the idea of patients who are potentially dangerous to themselves or to others. And oftentimes in these situations, when people are destabilized, we end up thinking about a hospitalization. And when there's no less restrictive alternative and a patient is potentially dangerous, uh, sometimes they will be recommended to go to a hospital. And in certain situations, we might have to invoke uh, the laws of the country to hospitalize them against their will. Oftentimes patients are not thrilled with the idea of going to a hospital and they might say, you can't do this to me, I don't want to go. Uh, unfortunately, this is what's required for their safety. One of the questions though that I've come across as a doctor is, uh, if a patient is recommended to go to a hospital but they refuse, uh, where does the halacha stand? It goes without saying that if a patient in any way might put other people's life in danger, then he should be hospitalized. Even if he would not be dangerous to others, but he might putting, be putting his own life in jeopardy, it is the same. You know, the only system in which a person is not allowed to put his life in danger is Torah. There could be no law prohibiting a person to kill himself. So in any legal system, that would not be defined as a crime. But our Torah, our life is not ours. Bal Korchacho Atu Chai. Kodesh Baruch Hu is the only one that gives life. He's the only one entitled to take away life. And we're here for a purpose. So our life is not ours to forego. So even if a patient wouldn't be of no danger to others, but he might put in, be putting his life in danger, then we need to do whatever is in our power to save him from himself. 
And if need be, the patient needs to be hospitalized. And I think in this sense, Dina de Malchus Adina, and if there's no other way to go about it, we should take advantage of the laws of the land, hospitalize a patient. Now, I'm not a professional, but it goes without saying that if we need to hospitalize a patient against this will, we need to go to the extreme to make him feel as comfortable as possible in the institution in which he is hospitalized. I know sometimes it's very difficult, but we need to do our utmost. But it is clear to me that if he would be endangering his life and Kalva Choyma other lives, then if need be, then he needs to be hospitalized. That goes without saying. Sometimes it's difficult for the family, not only for the patient, but uh, once again, it is the authority of the doctor to determine whether life would be in danger. Understood. The more difficult question would be if he is not putting any life in jeopardy, but we think the only way to treat him and give him proper treatment would be in an institution, and that would require hospitalization. Would that be enough to justify hospitalization? When he's not endangering any life, but we know the best way to treat him would be putting him into hospital. Would the, what would the law say in that case? Well, it's a very complicated one, and uh, it actually varies on state by state uh, within America and by country and country uh, without. Uh, the general idea is to pursue what's called the least restrictive environment of care, meaning that a hospital is more restrictive than care in the outpatient setting. Um, if a patient is willing, then certainly we hope to find a plan that will work for them. But there are certain cases whereby uh, if a person is unable to take care of themselves, and even if there isn't imminent danger, but they're in a situation that's headed towards imminent danger, uh, as a field, we will recommend a hospitalization. So I, I think the Rav asked the question, uh, Dr. Friedman, is there such a situation where there's not an imminent pikuach nefesh, but there's one that uh, the, the physician potential. sees in the future as a potential? But is there a situation in which we're not dealing with pikuach nefesh at all, neither imminent nor down the road, but we think it'll be impossible to treat the patient and to help him unless he's hospitalized. If he doesn't have the discipline or there's no one to see to it that he takes his medicines in similar situations. So certainly those cases exist uh, specifically when starting specific new treatments uh, within the field that require a patient to take a medication either multiple times a day or require a patient to take a medication in a certain fashion uh, where we would recommend a hospitalization. And I think in many cases uh, a patient has to be willing to do that according to secular law. Uh, how would the Torah view such a situation? That, that, that is a complicated question. And uh, I'm sorry to say I don't have a very definitive response. Uh, I, I mean, it would be totally comparable to a person that has any other illness, which is not life-threatening, and he doesn't want to, to care for himself. We would tell him, Alpitaira, you need to care for yourself, but we have we don't have the authority to impose treatment on him unless his life is in danger, unless it's Pikuach Nevis. I would assume it's the same regarding mental illness. If his life is not in danger or he's not endangering any other's life, then we could recommend to him, to his family, but I doubt we could hospitalize him against his will. What if a patient uh, does not have the ability to appreciate their situation, even if they're not being dangerous, and such a treatment could restore their ability to make decisions? I think in that case, uh, hospitalization, hospitalization probably would be justified, I'll be Allah. Thank you, Rav. Uh, Rav Shlomo, I know you wanted to ask a few questions. So one of the questions that uh, people ask us many times uh, is whether there's an advantage or a requirement to seeing a from professional as opposed to any somebody who is just experienced in the field. Is there any adifas 
to seeing a firm professional? So if a person needs to go to a cardiologist or an oncologist or any other doctor treating other uh, ailments, I would not see a very distinct uh, advantage of going to a firm doctor. I think you need to see the best doctor. When we're dealing with psychology and psychiatry as well, I think there would be an advantage to see a firm professional because it is important that the professional understands, understands the anxieties, the worries of their patient. I'm talking now like a total ignoramus in psychiatry or psychology, but I think it is important, definitely in psychology, probably in psychiatry as well, to understand, to understand your patient, what troubles him, what are his worries, what, what are his concerns, and uh, what causes his anxiety. The better you understand his world, his inner world, probably the more efficient and professional your treatment would be. So I would say there would be an advantage to see a firm professional. However, I would prefer a non-firm professional than a firm non-professional. I, th I think the Rove brings up an interesting point there that we often see in our community whereby uh, people will want to see somebody uh, who is not necessarily licensed. And while there are many uh, great human beings that ha are baleetsa, that are able to provide good advice, uh, who are unlicensed, as a general rule, somebody who does have a licensure, whether it's a social worker, a psychologist, uh, or another licensure within the field, has gone through a rigorous training that provides them with uh, an understanding of current research in the field and is furthermore bound by a code of ethics uh, that provides for the highest quality care. So while there are certainly people who do have licenses that don't necessarily act ethical and aren't necessarily upholding the standard of care within the field, I, I do believe that there is an advantage of seeing a licensed professional. And uh, as far as the idea of seeing a professional who comes from our community, I think that there is an advantage in terms of what's called cultural competency within the academic community, whereby understanding the culture of your patient is so important to not only appreciate uh, why they're suffering, but to give them the tools to be successful within the bounds of what's culturally appropriate. Yes, so I, as Dr. Friedman just said, there are some licensed people that are not very good, some people that lack license and they're great. But by far and large, we should assume that a person that is licensed is a professional and he knows what he's doing. P people that didn't have an official training and they don't have a license might have the best of intentions and they might give wonderful aids in many other areas, but what people sometimes lack to understand and what the Rambam makes clear in many of his writings, Kishem sheyesh cholayei haguf, yesh cholayei hanefesh. And body could be ill and I, 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 I'm not talking about the neshama. The neshama is something which is totally in the realm of the spiritual. But I'm talking about your mind. And people have mental illness. And mental illness is illness. And just like everyone understands, if you have a cardiac problem, if you have cancer, you're going to go to a doctor. And not to a self-proclaimed mumcha. It is the same with mental illness. So you need to go to a professional. And the only way to know that a person is a professional is if he's licensed. So you cannot go to someone that is not licensed. So I think if you need to choose between your love or a psychologist, if you have mental illness, go to the psychologist to be treated, go to the love to get a bracha. If you need to choose between a firm psychologist and a non-firm one, if they're both licensed and both professional 
As I said, and as Dr. Friedman explained, there is an advantage to go to a firm professional. But it is important that he is a professional. We need to understand that mental illness is for doctors and professionals to treat, and not for wonderful people that really want to be helpful. And they might be wise, and they might be totally ethical, tzaddikim and chassidim, but this is something for professionals to deal with. I think that we should not underestimate uh, the importance of the bracha, and I can say that as a psychiatrist, how important that is for our patients to feel supported and positive about uh, engaging in treatment. I think the importance of a bracha is not only the psychological aspect that the patient will feel more confident, we need to believe in brachas. Kodesh Bocha gave Avram Avinu the koyach to give brachas, and Avram passed it off to Yitzchak, and Yitzchak to Yankov, and Rabbein Obachye says, from Yankov to all the tzaddikim and great tzaddikim of every generation. So we believe in brachas. Nobody could promise, nobody could guarantee, but that's Tfilo. And Tfilo and Brucha are closely associated, but they are two different things. We believe in Tfilo, and we believe in Brochas as well. Yashur Koach Okay. I, I think one of the questions that gets brought up when we're talking about uh, therapy, psychology, social workers, and other licensed professionals, aside from psychiatrists, is what actually is psychotherapy? And uh, as a professional, I'd like to answer that uh, it's not necessarily the Freudian thing with cigars and couches and dreams, but rather psychotherapy is about learning the skills to be productive uh, outside of the therapy room. And as we learn more about the field of mental health, uh, we see that specific treatments like DBT and CBT and ACT uh, and all sorts of other good Roche Tevos are about uh, giving a patient the Kalium to deal with specific sy symptoms that they're experiencing. And uh, one of the things that I will experience in my practice uh, is that sometimes I'll give a patient a medication and a recommendation for therapy. And the patient will say, I'm happy to take your medication, doc, but I don't want to go to therapy. And I'll explain to them that therapy is, in fact, medication. Uh, it's something that you have to do to get healthy. And I'm wondering if the Rav has any thoughts on a doctor's recommendation for therapy, and is a patient uh, required to do it? Are they allowed to pick and choose what aspects of the treatment plan they're going to follow? You phrased the question in an interesting way. Are they allowed to pick and choose? So in Bobakama Peihei, as we know, and this formulation would enable one to make a mistake that the doctor has permission to heal. Is it just permission or is it an obligation? And it is only permission for the doctor to heal or does that include the patient? So what's not clear in the Gemara is clear in Tur and in Shulchan Aruch and Yeradeya Semen Shin Lamed Vav. Nitna Rishus L'Roi V'Larapis is not only Rishus, it's a Choyvo as well. It's an obligation, it's a precept, it's a mitzvah, and not only a permit. And this mitzvah is not only upon the doctor, it is on, upon the patient. So we know that Pikuach Nefesh is the greatest mitzvah and it overrides any other mitzvah in the Torah. Is that only Pikuach Nefesh? And if a person is ill and it is not a life-threatening disease, does he still have a mitzvah to look for treatment? He does. He does. And that is not as clear as Pikuach Nefesh we all are familiar with. 
So in Minchas Osha on Corona, that's my most recent Sefer, and, you know, it's, it's a big schus this past year, has been a difficult year on so many different levels. First and foremost, the loss of life. The Jewish community in the world has lost tens of thousands of lives. The world, millions. And it has been a challenge for Paiskim like me, just to address challenges and questions in all Dalat Chalke Shulchan Orach, Shalai Shorom We never dreamed these questions would come up. So throughout the year, I was just writing Chuvas the entire world. And when the Sefer came out some time ago, a person told me, I always admired you greatly, but I didn't know you were a prophet. I didn't know you were a Navi. And I said, neither did I. So could you please share with me how you reached that conclusion? So he looked at the Sefer and he says, I'm sure you started writing the Sefer three years ago. How did you know COVID is coming? So no, I'm not a prophet. At least I'm not aware that I'm a prophet. And I didn't start writing the Sefer three years ago, but it was a challenge. And questions were coming in from every corner of the globe, from every Jewish community, and I felt the responsibility to respond. So we tried to do our our duty and care for Am Chubei soil. So one of the chulas in this new sefer, I think it's Simon Bay's, deals with a very fundamental question. We find many suyas and shahs dealing with refuah, dealing with medicine and treatment. Is it also a chiv al pialocha just to adopt a healthy lifestyle? Diet, exercise. Are we obliged al pialocha just to seek treatment if we're, if we're sick. Because the lesson of the Gemara is, so this is permission for a doctor to heal. I think it would be a Kalva If a sick man should look for a remedy to his illness, wouldn't he have a chiv not to become sick? But I brought about 20 sources from Chazal, not just my wishful thinking, but many Gemaras that specifically deal with the Chiyuv to lead a healthy lifestyle. I said before, your life is not yours to put on the line, to put in jeopardy. Neither is your body yours. And a Kodesh Bochu gave you a body to look after. And the Rambam Menhelech's Deus makes an amazing statement, and he writes, Everything we do could be part of our routine of Avodah Hashem. When a person eats and drinks, he should bear in mind, I eat and drink, my body should be healthy, I should be able to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu. and then eating and drinking would be part of service of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, would be part of his Avodah Hashem. So, Yes, I think it is not only permissible, it is a chiyuv to do whatever is in your power to have a healthy lifestyle and not to fall ill. I think I strayed from the question. Would you please remind me again what the question I th- I was? I think the basic idea uh, was are things that are not necessarily taking a pill and putting it in one's mouth oh, yeah. so still part of medicine? Therapy. Yeah, therapy. Oh, so you phrase the question, is a, person, is a person entitled to choose what type of a treatment he wishes to take and what type of not? A person is not entitled to choose not to be well. And he's supposed to do everything required to be well. It's not the same level as Chiyav as Pikuach Nefesh. Pikuach Nefesh is Deich Shabbos. Any therapy or medication or treatment that is not life-saving is not Deich Shabbos. You can't eat Yom Kippur unless your life is in jeopardy. But still, you are obligated to take care of your health. Your life is not yours, neither is your body. 
So the Rambam Memori Nevuchim has an amazing line, and it is in Perek Gimel, Chele Gimel, Perek Chav Zayin, Kavones Klal HaToyro Shnei Dvorim, Tikkun HaNefesh, Tikkun HaGuf. Kavones Klal HaToyro Shnei Dvorim, Tikkun HaNefesh and Tikkun HaGuf. Tikkun HaGuf is not Hatzolos HaGuf. Just like Tikkun HaNefesh is not Hatzolos HaNefesh. Tikkun HaNefesh and Tikkun HaGuf. So once again, we are required to be well, bodily, mentally. And if your doctor says that the medication and therapy are two sides of the same coin, and both are required for your well-being, then you need to take them both. You could discuss with your doctor what is the course of therapy and what is required, but as a rule, your mitzvah is to be well. Yes, Rav. On that note, uh, is a person uh, required to exercise on a daily basis and to get enough sleep? Oh, that's a very difficult question for me to answer because whatever I say, people might say, Tur mi bein And they'll ask me, do you practice what you preach? And I don't. I don't exercise and I don't sleep enough. I've seen the Rav walk in the community, however. Uh... So let me answer on a personal note. After my wife passed away a little, a little more than three years ago, every night I took a 45-minute walk with one of my children. And what I had in mind was not the exercise, but therapy. I'm not a professional, but I thought it's important that I have some private time with each of one of my children just to talk. So every night, one of my children... We took a long walk, 45 minutes around the Shechuna. And it was a double benefit. Not only the importance after such a sad tragedy struck our family just to talk and to bring out our feelings. Uh, it also the extreme benefit of, of walking. And then I got a spur on my heel and it was very painful for me to walk and I stopped and after it went away, I did not get back to walking, and I regret it. Maybe after this conversation, I will start again. Could I say it's a chiv to exercise? It is the right thing to do. There is some limit before we could say a chiv. But exercise is good for your health. I know some Gedalia saw that never exercised, and they had no physical activities at all, and they lived more than 100 years. I know Rav Lyosha very well. I know Rav Shteman very well. I don't think they ever exercised. I doubt Rav Lyosha or Rav Shteman ever lifted weights. They probably never saw the interior of a gym. And they lived more than a hundred years with clarity of mind. This week in Israel, a young commander, 42 years old, passed away in the middle of exercising. Now, I'm not silly enough to try to argue that exercise is dangerous. A person died in a gym. People die everywhere. What I mean to say it's hard for me to say there's a chiyu of al pi to exercise, but it definitely is the right thing to do. And let me say this. I would not consider it bitl toil. If the greatest Talmud Chochem takes a half hour a day to walk, I would not consider it bitl toil. And if you're afraid it is bitl toil, take an MP3, you could listen to my shiurim on the way. So I'll enjoy it as well, if you exercise. But it definitely is the right thing to do. Regarding sleep, the Rambam Hilchas Deis Perik Dalad Alocha Dalad writes very interesting formula. The day has twenty-four hours, 
And it is enough to sleep a third of the day. And the Rambam makes the arithmetic. He doesn't rely on your brilliance. It's enough to sleep a third of the day, which means eight hours. From the Rambam, it's much more. You could sleep nine or ten, but at least eight hours. I don't recall ever sleeping eight hours in a day. And I won't share with you how much I do sleep. That is classified information, but I don't sleep enough. And I recently read that in my age it is even more important to get sufficient sleep. I think today professionals would say everybody is different, and we can't say how many hours a person needs to sleep. But sufficient sleep is extremely important to your health. And you should get enough sleep and you should get exercise. And this belongs in the context of what I mentioned before, that it is not only when you're sick to look for treatment. You also have a mitzvah to sustain your health and to adopt a healthy lifestyle. Exercise is good. And there is a fine line. So let me discuss some lambdas with you. I just quoted the Rambam and Moin of Uchim. Klal kavona satoyr shnei dvorim. Tikkun enefesh ve tikkun agof. But there's another Rambam in the introduction to Shas, and I'm quoting that Rambam. Seems to be a total contradiction. Ki tchilat hasechal yitzayer. Tikkun enefesh v'chur ban agof. This seems to be terrible stila. So Amoyin Avuchim, the Rambam writes that the Torah has two intentions, Tikkun HaNefesh plus Tikkun HaGuf. The Rambam in introduction to, to Shas, to Pesha Mishnah, writes, no, Tikkun HaGuf, Chor Ben HaNefesh. Chor Ben HaGuf, Tikkun HaNefesh. I think there are two concepts of Tikkun HaGuf and HaNefesh. So today there's a field, bodybuilding. People spend their lives, hours every day, exercising, pumping iron, lifting weights. I don't even think it's healthy. I don't think these people have very long lives. That is worshipping your body. That is churban anefesh. That's what the Ramba means when he says, Tikkun Aguf Churban Anefesh and Tikkun Anefesh Churban Aguf. But sustaining your health, that is part of your Avoidus Hashem. So you don't need to run 10 hours a day, you don't need to worship your body, worship your soul, worship your Neshama. You need to understand that life is all about your neshama, and this entire world is a transitional stage. It's a it's a prosdor But to make it to the castle, you need to be healthy, and a healthy neshama requires a healthy gulf. So, what the Rambam means to totally reject is you know worshiping the human form and the human body and investing in. That is totally detrimental to Torah values. But sustaining your health is part of your chil, it's part of your avoidance Hashem. So you need to sleep well, you need to eat in a healthy fashion, and dedicate your life to the service of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, to Torah and Mitzvahs and Masim Toiv. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rav. On that note, I think it's so important to consider the idea of taking care of one's body, uh, taking medications as prescribed, and participating in therapy uh, when that's uh, recommended by the doctor as well. What should a family member do when their loved one is not interested in accepting treatment? Uh, most specifically, I, I would say, to what extent are family members required to take achrayas for their loved ones when it comes to uh, ensuring that a doctor's recommendations are carried out. And the closer you are, 
the more responsibility you bear. Mipsor Hualtis Alim. Many times there's a limit to what family members could do. So it is clear that the closer you are, the more responsibility you bear. Parents need to care for their children, and that is the highest level of responsibility in caring for another, because your children can care for themselves. But close family members bear more responsibility than others. But we all are responsible one for another, and that is unique about Klal Yisrael, about the Jewish people. We are all one big extended family. And if a house comes crashing down a surfside in Florida, the entire Jewish world is depressed. And that is beautiful about who we are and what we are. And Chazal make the statement, Kol Yisrael Arevim ze Beze. We all bear responsibility for one another, but it goes without saying. The closer you have, the more influence you have, you'll bear a greater level of responsibility. And mental care in this aspect would be no different than other fields of medicine. And sometimes a patient needs to be convinced and encouraged and, and made to appreciate how important it is for him to get, to get professional care. The problem with mental patients is sometimes that their the process of thought and decision is impaired because of their illness. So it is easier to talk in a sensible way with people that might have other medical problems than with mental patients. But there's a limit to what we can do. And in a response to a previous question just a few minutes ago, we spoke about hospitalizing a person against his will. So I think family should really dedicate thought and planning how to approach these situations and how to be most helpful. Ultimately, what it boils down to is compassion and caring. So there's a beautiful Hasidic story, but my time is already running short. So the Moshe Leib Sasev has said, the essence of we have to rachel tamoichu. He learned from an Anju. And he said, I was once walking in the street and I happened to overhear a conversation between two non Jews. Mr. A asks Mr. B, Do you love me? And Mr. B says, How do you dare to ask this question? We've been friends for 20 years. So Mr. A asks, What hurts me? Mr. B says, How would I know you didn't tell me? Did you ask? Do you really want to know? So the Moshe Leib Sasseva said, it is then that I understood the essence. Do you care? Do you really want to know? Some people hearing this story might wonder, a great tzaddik, a Talmud of Rabbi Melech Mezhensk, needs to learn from a Goy. I just want to remind the story of Dome Ben So Chazal tell us, Kibbed we learned from Dome Ben he was a non-Jew. So what it boils down to, do you really care? Family members that really care will take the time and the thought, discuss amongst themselves how they could be most helpful. So you can't put him in handcuffs and take him to the doctor. But if you really care, then you will find a way, dedicate thought, take your time, Try to speak with your family member and try to be helpful in getting the right treatment for him. I know that uh, we're running short on time and we're tremendously grateful for the rough's time. I think there's one very important question that uh, the community is concerned with and Rav Shlomo wanted to ask. Uh, in general, the question was covered already when the Rav was discussing earlier about licenses and importance of being professional, um, but the Rav also said that uh, we have an achrais to one another, so a lot of times we find that there are some very well-meaning people, askanim, um, who are able 
to help people with medications. Uh, they themselves know a tremendous amount within the field. Um, is it the right thing? Uh, are we, are, are we, should we stick to only those who really are professional? Can somebody be a professional while being a non-professional? I already addressed this question before, and I think uh, only a professional could offer any treatment, especially when we're dealing with medicine. I am very disturbed by mashgichim and yeshivas that demand from parents to give Ritalin for the children. Ritalin is a drug, and only a doctor could prescribe drugs. My dear friend, Rabbi Nemelech Firer, is a genius. He knows a great deal about medicine. I have some very well-known doctors who admire his level of knowledge in medicine. And he is so careful never to directly suggest a course of treatment without a doctor. He will refer you to the doctor. He will say what he thinks needs to be done, but he will never overstep the line between an asking, as brilliant as he may be, and the responsibility of a doctor. Very few people have the level of knowledge that Rafir has. So I think Asconim have place in our communities. They are of great help in referring to people and giving them the aids uh, whom to turn to. But I think they should be very careful not to overstep. Only a doctor could prescribe drugs. Only a professional could really determine a course of treatment for a patient. So Rabbeinu Bachya has an amazing thought. Both pays are paid the gushos. Ki Hashem roifecho is a pay refuyo. When your cure will come by doctors, it usually involves pain, whether it's surgery or medicine. When a Kodesh Boch who sends Rafuas Mena Shemaim, they do not cause pain. So let us hope, in the source of our Tfilis and trying to do the right thing, a Kodesh Boch who, Boire Rafuas, Ki Ani Hashem Refecho, a Kodesh Boch who should send Rafuas and Yeshuas to our people. And then Dr. Frieden will have more time to learn in Kailo, in my Kailo, or anywhere else. Amen. Amen. Amen.